open with me to the gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter this morning. I'd like to draw your attention to the 13th verse today as we consider together praise in the storm. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard about it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you today for your word that is living and powerful. Lord, you know every need represented here today. Lord, your spirit searches the deep things of God. Lord, you reveal them to those whose hearts are open to you and seeking after you. So Lord, speak today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Aside from the resurrection of the dead, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle recorded in all four of the gospel accounts. According to John's gospel, the Passover feast was drawing near. And this provides for us a timeline meaning that Jesus was now only one year away from his death on the cross. At this point, many miracles had already taken place. There was the healing of the man with the withered hand, the healing of the centurion's servant, the widow of Nain's son had been raised from the dead on the way to his burial, the synagogue leader's daughter was raised from the dead, the woman with the issue of blood, had been healed when she took hold of the hem of Jesus' garment. It was also during this season of ministry that Jesus taught the people many things. He had already spoken the Sermon on the Mount, as well as many parables concerning the kingdom of heaven. And it was because of his authoritative teaching and his undeniable miracles that the crowds were now the largest that they had ever been. The Gospels of Mark and Luke reveal that the disciples had recently returned from a short missionary journey and they had come back to share with Jesus the praise reports of their ministry throughout Galilee. However, Matthew also informs us during the exact same time that Jesus received word of the brutal murder of his cousin, John the Baptist. Pause for a moment and think of that. In one sense, there is rejoicing over the successful missionary venture, but there is also sorrow and grief over the death and loss of a loved one. When Jesus heard the news, it says that he departed to a solitary place. He needed time away from the demands of the ministry. There was so much activity. One of the gospel writers tells us they didn't even have time to eat. And so Jesus departed in order to find rest. However, as Jesus attempted to withdraw from the crowds, they saw him leave. And they followed him on foot to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when he arrived, there was a large crowd there to welcome him. And Matthew tells us in verse 14, Jesus' response when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. When Jesus saw the people, although grieving himself, although struggling in his own loss, he had compassion for other people. He was moved with a deep sense of concern for others. He knew their need. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They were weary. They were scattered. Many of them would prove to be shallow in their commitment to Jesus. 
48 hours after this miracle, somewhere around there, many people no longer followed Jesus when he did not fulfill their messianic picture. And yet still, he ministers to them in compassion. I've always marveled at this moment in the compassion of Jesus, that he was moved. And the word that is used for moved is the word meant to be moved in the deepest place where emotion could be felt. Jesus had pity and compassion on the people and empathy for humanity because he knew their condition. Folks, listen, the Lord knows your condition as well. He knows where you're at this morning. He knows what your needs are. The Lord knows what you're going through at this very moment. The Bible tells us in Psalm 34 and verse 14 that the eyes of the Lord that they are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. When the Lord looks at you, he looks with eyes of compassion. He is concerned for you. Jesus healed those who were sick and he spent the day teaching the people late into the evening. Verse 15, it says, when it was evening, his disciples came to him and they said, this is a deserted place and the hour is late Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that the the disciples came to Jesus and they encouraged him to send the people home. It it was late. They, They needed to eat. And if they didn't eat, they would faint perhaps on the way. The disciples saw a need, but they felt it was best to have someone else meet the need. It's a very practical and logical suggestion. I mean, they were in a deserted place. It makes sense. I'm certain that the response that the disciples received from Jesus to their practical suggestion was a complete surprise. For we read in in Matthew, Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. That was a complete impossibility. How could the disciples provide for over 5,000 people? They had a limited supply. In fact, in verse 17, they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. The disciples immediately looked at what they had and they realized very quickly that they didn't even have enough to feed the 12 of them, let alone over 5,000 people. And when you compare the gospel accounts at this moment, you come to find out where they actually got the loaves and fish. John informs us at this moment that Jesus turned to his disciple Philip and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And He said this, John tells us, to test Philip, for he knew what he himself would do. This was a test for the disciples. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He's the master of the situation. But he turns to the disciples and said, hey, what do you think? Why should we feed all these people? Where should we go buy some some bread? And immediately Philip begins to crunch the numbers. And he said, 200 denarii worth of bread isn't sufficient for them. That means eight months of wages, even if we did have that and we don't. But even if we did, even that wouldn't be enough to to scratch the surface of the need that is in front of us. Jesus was allowing the faith of his disciples to be tested. Their first response, send them away. The next response, what do we have on hand? Mark's gospel informs us that Jesus then asked the question, Mark chapter six, how many loaves do you have? What do you have? Where did they get the few loaves and fish? Again, comparatively, John tells us that there was one of the disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother. He said, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? As the disciples begin, again, to look to their resources, they realize they didn't have anything. However, Andrew did find a kid with lunch. And he had five barley loaves and a few fish. Someone said, quote, that the greatest miracle that day was not that Jesus multiplied the boy's lunch into a feast, but that this growing boy still had his lunch uneaten by the middle of the afternoon. (laughs) After Andrew brought this young man, willing to offer what he had. Immediately, Andrew said, but what is this? I mean, really, 
among so many. It's almost like he said, oh, Jesus, I have an idea. Never mind, never mind. It's not a good idea. This is a terrible idea. It's only, it could never, I don't know what I was thinking. You ever felt that way? Lord, this is all I have to offer. But what could this accomplish in comparison to the need that is present? Did you know that God has ways of using seemingly small and insignificant things to accomplish great miracles. A little goes a long way in the hands of Jesus. A rock could take out a giant. A stick raised up could part the Red Sea. After the disciples told Jesus of their limited resources that they had, Jesus then said to them in verse 18 of Matthew, bring them here to me. Bring what you have and place it in the hands of Jesus. In the hands of the disciples, the resources could not meet their own needs. But in the hands of Jesus, it's a completely different story. Jesus said, bring what you have to me. Folks, listen, sometimes the Lord will allow us to be placed into circumstances that are far beyond us. We don't have the resources nor the giftedness to meet the need or accomplish the task. But that is the very place that God wants us to be in order that this would not be an obstacle for us to somehow avoid or get over, but an opportunity for God's power to be revealed. Jesus made his disciples aware of the need. He then told them to meet the need. They quickly came to the realization it was impossible for them to meet the need, which in turn led them back to Jesus, who was the only one who could meet the need. Then they took what they had and placed it in the hands of Jesus. And then Jesus gave it back to them to use them to meet the need. And when it was all said and done, guess who got the glory? Jesus. That's how he wants it. That's how he likes it. <laughs> that way. No one could say what is about to be accomplished was done by men. It had to be divine. It had to be God. And you may be in a situation like that this morning where what you're facing and what only, only God, only God. But the fact is God can. You can't, I can't, but he can. And so here they are. And after the disciples had taken what they had, placed it in the hands of Jesus, he did give them an assignment. He did give them a job to do. It says in verse 19 that he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. John tells us in the sixth chapter, in the 10th verse, that Jesus said to the disciples, make the people sit down. And there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000. The disciples could not feed the people, but they could have the people sit down. Jesus gave them something to do that they were capable of doing. Listen, he's doing the heavy lifting. What are they doing? Just sit down, please. Just sit down. Right? Sit down. I can do that. S sit. They, they were able to do that. He let them do something and then he did the rest. Listen, you do what you can. You do what, what he allows you to do and enables you to do and leave the rest to him. Listen, he does the heavy lifting. He just asks you to step out. He just asks you, have them sit down and I'll feed them. This is your job. This is my job. He gave them something he could do. Sadly, some people worry so much about and analyze what they are incapable of doing rather than doing what they can. And so they never do anything. Well, I could never do that. Well, what can you do? Well, I could probably ha have people sit down. Great, do that. And then allow the Lord to do what he wants to do. Well, I could probably show up. That is fantastic. Show up and see what God could do. That's just what he's asking. He's not asking them to feed the multitudes. He's asking them to sit down. And then it says in verse 19, and please notice this, and he, that is Jesus, took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he, Jesus, blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples then gave to the multitudes. Jesus takes the loaves and the fish and he blesses it. He breaks it. He places it back into the hands of the disciples and then they go out and serve the people. 
and then they come back and Jesus gives them more and they go back out and they come back and Jesus gives them more. Church, Jesus becomes the supply, the source. If the disciples were going to continue to feed the multitude, continue to see miracles take place, where were they going to go? They had to keep coming back to Jesus. And as long as they came back to Jesus, there was a consistent supply to meet the need. It's found in him. And I have found in life and certainly in ministry that Jesus is the source. Any person here that desires to be used by the Lord in any capacity, you got to come to Jesus. You place what you have. Yourself. Present yourself, the Bible says, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And I'll tell you what will happen when you do that. Oh, he'll bless. But he'll also break you. It says he blessed it and he broke it. What do you mean break me? I mean humble you. And why is that? So that you'll realize, and I'll know, that it has more to do with Jesus than it has anything to do with me. If anything's accomplished, if anything is, takes place that's lasting or fruitful or a blessing, it's because of Jesus. He will bless you. He'll break you. Some people haven't been broken. They're just too full of themselves to be filled with anything the Lord would like to impart to them. They have to come to the end of themselves. They have to come to this place where you are humble before God. And when you realize you can't do it, you cannot do it without him. And if you think you can, go ahead, try, and you will find, as many of us have discovered, I need you, God. The disciples had nothing apart from what Jesus supplied. I have nothing apart from what Jesus gives me. I have to come to him. He is my source. There have been many times in my life when I have come to this realization. Early on in the planting of a church in a state that I knew, we knew one other family, it became so clear to me, unless the Lord shows up, unless the Lord builds a house, those that labor, labor in vain. And I remember taking walks with the Lord and there were these little man-made lakes by our house. And I would wake up early and walk with the Lord. And I mean, cry out to God. I mean, it's a good thing you didn't hear me, but I would cry out to God. And I would say, God, please, if you don't show up, if, if you don't do something, nothing will ever be accomplished. And you know, the Lord answered my prayer. He answered my cry when I came to the end of myself. When I came to the end of myself, that is when God began to work. Matthew tells us that the loaves and the fish were first placed in the hands of Jesus, blessed by Jesus, broken by Jesus, and then used by Jesus. And the results of this miracle, they were staggering. We read here in verse 20, so they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. And now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. About 5,000 men besides, meaning there could have been anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people there, including women and children. And they all ate, and the language says they were filled. That means glutted, stuffed. Oh, I mean, they couldn't eat anymore. Like you on Thanksgiving, when you just reach up for that last, I can't, I, I probably can. And you do it anyway. They were like that. And when the meal had ended, it says that they gathered up all that was left over and there were 12 baskets full. Imagine the 12 disciples just standing there, perhaps each one with a basket looking at each other and thinking, we had the bag, we gave it here. He well, How did we end up with this? Everybody knows. It had nothing to do with these 12 men. It had everything to do with Jesus. In his hands, his work, his power. And it's what happens, man. You just look and you think, Lord, look what you've done. Look what you've done. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. 
This miracle teaches us several lessons. One, that Jesus is all powerful, (laughs) that he can make something out of nothing. It also reveals to us that the Lord can use human instruments to minister to the needs of the people. It reveals that little is much in the hands of the Lord. It shows us not to take anything for granted. And the whole purpose of this miracle was to draw attention to Jesus. If the disciples had simply held on to the lunch themselves, they would have missed out on what Jesus would have done. Friend, you don't want to miss out on anything that Jesus wants to do in your life. Give your life to God. He can do more with it than you can. Just surrender yourself to him. Submit to him. Allow him to use your life. This miracle was so powerful and overwhelming to the people that it caused the crowds to think back to the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses said these words. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. This was a prophetic word spoken by Moses pointing to the person of the Messiah pointing to Jesus. So here is Jesus like Moses providing bread. Manna, as it were, out of nothing. And the people make the connection from Old Testament to the present. And they said, this this is the one that Moses told us about. This is the Messiah. The people were so moved. The Bible tells us that they attempted to force Jesus at that moment to become their king. They were ready. They had read the prophetic scriptures about the Messiah coming and establishing his kingdom. Certainly Jesus had been preaching about the kingdom. This must be the moment. And so they were about to force him to be king. And yet Jesus, we find in verse 22, it says, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. It wasn't time for him to rule and reign. It was time for him to suffer and die. Later, he would rule and reign. But now, this was the first part of his mission. And the interesting thing is he forced his disciples to get in the boat, almost as if they were caught up in the moment too. If you're the king and we're the closest to you, this is great. It's happening. Jesus said, get in the boat. Oh, oh, I thought we were going to, the 12, we're not going to, no? No, get in the boat. Go to the other side. And then it says, after he sent the multitudes away, verse 23, he sent them away. He went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening had come, he was alone there. But the boat, it was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Jesus withdrew from the crowds to a solitary place to commune with his father, to pray. He needed this time alone. I have always taken note of the fact that if Jesus found it necessary to withdraw, to be alone in solitude with his father, in prayer. How much more important is it for us to have those times alone with the Lord in prayer, in fellowship with him? As Jesus withdrew, he is praying and no doubt interceding on behalf of his disciples who at that moment were in the midst of a storm. There on the Sea of Galilee, It lies in the lower portion of the Jordan Valley. It's a mountain range that rises to about 4,000 feet above sea level. The lake itself is 700 feet below the Mediterranean Sea. And this body of water, the Lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, as it's called, is susceptible to sudden, extreme, violent storms. And these storms are caused by the cold air rushing down from the mountains surrounding it, colliding with the warm, moist air rising off the surface of the water itself, and storms will come in and begin to fill boats. It's rather intense. And when you read the Gospels collectively, you get an understanding of the details of the storm and the actual danger that the disciples were in. And the storm that the disciples encountered was not because they were disobedient to God. 
They were being obedient to the commands of Jesus. Jesus was the one that sent them into the storm. Jesus was the one that said, go to the other side. There are storms of correction. Jonah experienced one. He ran from God. And so God sent a storm to get Jonah where he wanted him to go. But the disciples We're doing exactly what Jesus said. I bring this out to say you may be right in the center of God's will for your life and in one of the most difficult seasons and storms that you have ever encountered. It does not mean that you are outside the will of God or that God is judging you or that you have no faith. God may be strengthening your faith. God may be refining it at this moment. This is where the disciples were. The other thing that stands out to me is when this storm happened. It was right after following the, one of the greatest miracles of all time. You talk about a mountaintop experience. You talk about seeing the power of God revealed and then right after that, right into a trial. Has that ever happened to you? You ever experienced that? Some of the greatest moments you've ever had as a believer only to come down off that mountain and be confronted with something that you did not expect. This is where the disciples were. Matthew tells us, that the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, being pounded by the waves. The wind was against it, contrary to them. Now keep in mind that the disciples were sent probably in the evening, maybe somewhere between 7 to 9 o'clock in the evening. They begin their boat ride across to the other side. However, in verse 25 of Matthew, look at what it says. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The fourth watch, that's anywhere between three and six o'clock in the morning. What that tells us is that the disciples were in the boat for about six hours at least while Jesus was on the mountainside praying. He allowed them to struggle. He allowed it. I don't know why. People ask that question. How could God allow this? I don't know the answer to all those questions. Why did God allow us to experience this? How come we lost this? What happened to that? And I thought I was being faithful to the Lord. What did we do? Where is God? Those are the kind of questions you ask when you are allowed to struggle, when you're in the midst of it. That's what they're wondering. How could you send us into this? How can this be for good? They were about to find out, but it wasn't until the fourth watch. Maybe you're at the third watch. Could you show up now? Nope, not till the fourth. What about the second watch? That would be great. Nope, not till the fourth. I mean, they're, they're, he's allowing them to go through this to struggle. But that wasn't the end of the story. You might be rowing like crazy and thinking, we're going down. They're at the point where they want to give up. They're exhausted. They are weary. That may describe you. But it was at that very moment when they could go no further. Look at what happens. Jesus shows up in a miraculous way. It says, notice this. In the midst of the storm, Jesus came walking on the water. And now the disciples are not just fearful. They are terrified. And the reason is that they thought Jesus was a ghost. That's interesting. They were so fearful. These guys grew up on the water. They had never in their life ever seen anyone walk on the water. This was the first time for sure. First time they ever saw this. He is walking to them in an unexpected way. They are in the midst of a storm. Jesus shows up. Sometimes, folks, listen, in the midst of our own storms, Jesus shows up in the most unexpected ways. He uses people. They show up with and say, hey, listen, the Lord placed you on my heart. And this is a passage of scripture. I don't know why, but I just feel like the Lord wanted me to share this with you. How, they don't know what you're going. How did they know? I don't know. God revealed it. God gave it to them. Jesus shows up. Provision comes and you think, I don't know where it's going to come from and how we're going to pay this or how we're going to take care of that. And in that very moment, it shows up. Only the Lord can do that. Only the Lord can provide it. That's him showing up in unexpected, unique ways. And here are the disciples thinking the worst thing in the world is about to happen, not only are we going to drown, but there's a ghost on the water. (laughs) But listen, folks, what they feared would be the worst thing to happen ended up being the best thing that could ever happen because it was Jesus. 
It was Jesus. Jesus comes to them and he speaks to them. And look at the words of Jesus. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Hey guys, cheer up. It's me. I mean, of all the things, don't be afraid. You only say that to people who are. They were afraid. They were terrified. And Jesus said, I just want to let you know, I'm in this. I'm here. I'm right here. You are afraid. You don't need to be. I'm here. Rejoice. It's me. How do you praise in the storm? How do you rejoice in the storm? Someone here this morning needs to hear that word. Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Well, what happened next is even more amazing. For Peter responds. And he said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. <laughs> what a request. What made you? How come? Were well, the other disciples like, what? What are you thinking? Another translation says, since it is you, call me onto the water. And Jesus said, come. And when Jesus spoke that, Peter came down out of the boat and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. It's hard to imagine what would have prompted Peter to ask such a question. But Jesus responded, it's me. When did Peter get out? When he heard Jesus say, it's me. How do you know if God's calling you into something, calling you out? And listen, I'll tell you this. He will call you out. He will call you to take steps of faith. The Bible says the Christian life, we walk by faith and not by sight. He'll call you out. He'll call you to take a step of faith. He'll ask you to step into something that is impossible for you. Well, God will never give me anything more than I can handle. Really? Really? Can I just clear the air on that? There's plenty of things that I can't handle, but I can handle it if he's with me. That's the difference. Here's Peter saying, Lord, if it's you, and then he waits, and the Lord says, come on, Pete, it's me. It wasn't until he heard that it was Jesus that he got out. If you don't hear Jesus, if there's no peace, if there's no confirmation from the word of God, then stay in the boat until he says and makes it clear, come on out. And when he does, then you step out. That's when you take steps of faith. When you know it's the Lord, God will make it clear. And it could be as simple as it's me. And he's showing you everything you've, you need to know. And then you're going to have to step out. Listen, you show me a person that's never stepped out of the boat and gotten wet. I'll show you a person that's never done anything for the kingdom of God. Peter was willing to get out. And I'll tell you this, he got out alone. And he was walking to Jesus. Jesus called him. He was going to Jesus. Now, it says in verse 30, something else happened. But when he saw, that is, Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. While walking on the water, Peter suddenly became very aware of his surroundings. Waves hitting him in the face. I mean, he is just, he's getting soaked and yet he's got his eyes on Jesus and then he suddenly looks around, what am I doing? Takes his eyes off the Lord and he begins to sink. Happens to us as well. And as he began to sink, prayed the quickest prayer you could ever pray. Lord, save me. Blah, blah. You know, he's going down and Jesus just reaches down grabs that burly fisherman and pulls him in the boat. And he said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Folks, I don't believe that when Jesus spoke those words to Peter, he said it in a way that was condemning. Oh, Peter, where's your faith? I don't think it was like that. I think it was excitement. You were doing so good. <laughs> Hey, little faith, what happened? You were, you were walking on water. Peter's like, I know, that was crazy. I mean, I, mean, I think it was an, an encouraging thing. Listen, so many people want to emphasize the fact that the guy sunk because he took his eyes off Jesus. But don't forget to emphasize the fact 
that he walked on water. I don't see any of the other disciples doing that. He walked on water. And Jesus was right there just to pull him up, to save him when he needed saving. Faith is strong only when the object of your faith is strong. As long as your faith is in your circumstances, as long as your faith is focused on anyone or anything apart from Jesus, then it really doesn't matter how much faith you have. You will fall sooner or later. On the other hand, if the focus of your faith is Jesus, if he is the emphasis, then you can rest secure. Spurgeon said, little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Trusting in God. Stepping out into things that you could never do unless Jesus was in, involved. It says, then when they got in the boat, I love this, the wind ceased. The storm came to an end. I love that passage of scripture, this too shall pass. That's a, that's a good one. The storm doesn't last forever. There's a time when it will come to the end. Maybe you're wondering, Am I, is this it? Are we done? Or can we get off the boat now? You'll notice verse 33, the response to the wind ceasing. It says, then those who were in the boat, verse 33, they came and they worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Do you know this is the first time that the disciples acknowledge Jesus in this way and actually worshiped him and he received it. What they had gone through in the storm brought them to a place of praise and adoration and worship as they recognized who was actually in the boat. Do you know that storms have a way of doing that? You know that trials have a way of revealing God and his power that in ways that we've never seen before. I know that this room is full of people who have walked through difficult things, challenging things. And the Lord has revealed himself in ways that are hard to describe. And, all that, and it brought you to this place where what else can be my response? You brought me through the storm. You were with me in the midst of the storm. You came to me when I was there. Lord, I worship you. You are God. You are worthy of my praise. He's the God of the storm. Now, when they made it to the other side, thank you, Jesus, they made it to the other side. When they crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region and brought to him all who were sick and they begged him that he might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Interesting, Jesus' earlier miracle had traveled to the other side. People had heard about this woman at some point that had taken hold of the hem of Jesus' garment. And so now everybody was coming up and pulling on his outfit. I mean, all, everybody just, imagine getting off the boat and everybody just grabbing you. And as they were touching the hem of his garment, they were also healed. The ministry of Jesus continued on the other side. Friend, chances are you may be in a storm or maybe you're coming out of the storm or maybe you're about to go in a storm. The Christian life seems to follow that pattern. Storms are unavoidable. The question is where you're building your house. Jesus said there were two men one built on the sand and one built on a rock. Both of them encountered storms. The rains descended and fell upon them. The house that was built on sand crumbled because the foundation was not solid enough to support it. So when it came, it crumbled, it fell apart. And every single person, non-believer, believer, you will have your day where what you say you believe or what you think you believe will be put to the test. You're an atheist, you're gonna have your day. 
where you're going to have to reason beyond your own brain. You're going to have to think, what do I believe anyway? I've been saying this whole time there is no God, but I realize at this moment I actually need more than I have. God, are you real? You'll have your day. If you're a Christian, everything we believe everything you know, everything you've highlighted, memorized, it'll be put to the test. And either you are building your life upon this and you will stand, or you're not building your life on this and you will crumble. Can I encourage you today? Build your life on Christ. Build your life on Jesus. There is no more solid foundation. Everything else is sinking sand, as the hymn says. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Are you listening to the Lord today saying, be of good cheer? It's me. Don't be afraid. I'm here. Oh, may the Lord open your ears today. May he open our ears today to be able to hear. May we see Jesus walking to us in unexpected ways. Listen, passage of scripture, I've found great comfort through the years. Isaiah chapter 43, it says this. The Lord's speaking to his people and we are also his people and therefore we can take hold of this promise. But now, I love that, now. Now. Today, this moment, wherever you're at, thus says the Lord who created you. He's speaking, oh, Jacob, he who formed you. God created you, God formed you. God knew you when you were intricately woven in your mother's womb. He's always known you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. That means he purchased us. It's, it points to the cross, the redemption. I've, you don't have to fear because first of all, I redeemed you. I bought you. I handled the biggest problem you're ever going to face in your life through redemption. By offering my blood and applying it to your life, you by faith, you can be saved. He's redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You're mine. And notice this. When, not if, but when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. It may feel like they're going to overflow you. You may feel like you're going under, but the Lord said, I'm there. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. Are you passing through the waters today? Are the rivers rising? Is the heat intensifying? He's with you. He's there. You can trust him. Be of good cheer. Praise him in the storm, church. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you are unchanging, that who you are here in our Bible is who you are today in this moment. <laughs> thank you, Lord. We choose to build our life upon the foundation, which is Christ. Lord, for any this morning who are in the midst of a storm that is overwhelming. I pray that the fourth watch would come, Lord, and you would just show up in a way that only you can. And they would recognize you and walk on the waves, Lord, with eyes on you, Lord. Eyes of faith. Father, for those perhaps who are ready to give up and are questioning why and how come and maybe those watching from a hospital room today, those who are at home sick and unable to come, those who are in other countries serving you and other places of the world wondering what, what's happening. Lord, would you minister to them that you are there? 
Oh, we love you, Jesus. And we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Will you stand with us, church? Perhaps the Lord has spoken to you this morning. Maybe you find yourself in circumstances that we discussed today. Can I encourage you? Come up for prayer. There'll be those up front that would love to pray for you. Maybe you need to speak with a pastor. I would encourage you to make an appointment. Maybe come in and meet with one of the ministers and just share what's going on and pray through some things. Receive some godly counsel. There is wisdom in the multitude of counselors, the Bible says. Godly counselors at that. If not, may the Lord bless you and keep you this week. He'll take us through the storm, guys. One day, hey, listen, one day this storm's going to (laughs) end. We're going to come in to the place of glory. Until then, just keep going. Keep your eyes on Jesus this week. God bless you, church.